Hi, everybody. My name is George Brown. I'm the executive director of the Highlights Foundation. I'm so excited for today's session. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoy the show. And Allison, will you please give us formal introductions? <laughs> sure, of course. Welcome all this afternoon to our Illustrator Highlights Foundation Gather. We are grateful to have Pat Cummings, our host today, to talk with art directors Laurent Lynn and Cecilia Young. All three panelists serve on the board of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, a wonderful organization that we love that is full of support for children's book writers and illustrators. Pat, as so many of you know, is an author, illustrator, and teacher. She has helped make so many people's dreams come true when it comes to the page, bringing their um, children's books to life. And uh, we are so grateful for her help in bringing this panel together today. Laurent Lynn is an author, illustrator, and art director at Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers. And Cecilia Young is an art director and vice president at Penguin Books for Young Readers, where she oversees illustration and design for G.P. Putnam Sons and the Nancy Paulson Books imprints. Pat, Laurent, and Cecilia have come together today to talk about the lessons and legacy of Tommy DePaulo, his quiet, bold visual storytelling. Thank you all for being with us today. Pat, I'm going to turn things over to you and I'll step back in um, when it's time for us to do the Q&A. Okay. okay, and you've told everybody that there's no questions about quantum physics. Correct, yes, yes. that's okay. right in the chat, okay. yep. I know you said that a lot, okay. But I'm just so glad everybody could make it. Um, I think for everybody, the loss of Tommy was such a sudden and um, huge shock and such a loss to the children's book community. And I know that there's gonna be programs that have been already programs about Tommy's work. I think if any of you guys uh, watched the one that Cecilia and Laurent did with SCBWI, there were so many lessons of Tommy's woven into their talk about illustration. Because everything, um, every time you ran into Tommy, it was informative. I wanted to just say before we get started, I first met Tommy way back in, I don't even remember, I think the 80s. Um, I was doing a program in Boston. It was one of my first public, you know, um, programs. And I was going to a conference. Um, it was a conference at the library and I didn't know anybody. And I know from going to so many SCBWI conferences, how it feels to show up at those conferences and feel like you don't know anybody and that you don't know anything about the business. You don't know who all the players are and everything. And so I felt really kind of like lost and out of it, like a newbie. And Tommy said, let's have lunch. And I thought the mega star you know, of the program to sit down and have lunch with him. And Tommy was so welcoming and open and warm and generous. And the whole lunch is telling me all these things about the business, giving me pointers and stuff like that, just such a helping hand. And I didn't, you know, I'd come there not knowing him at all and left feeling like we were best friends, you know? And I think Tommy had that effect on people in general. And knowing that he went to those conferences, I would see him at all the SCBWI conferences, always bringing in people. And if you knew Tommy or had a chance to be in his presence even, you know how outgoing and warm he was. And what I wanted to do, hopefully, was to have this program focus more on Tommy, the person, um, even though we're going to be talking about his work, there's so much takeaway from the way he lived his life. And so we wanted to kind of focus on that. And nobody, I think, well, maybe, I don't think many people knew him better than Cecilia and Laurent because they worked with him. Um, I was going to show you a video, but before we start, is there anything you guys would like to say in introductory um, about Tommy or about um, before we get started? Because I want to show this little clip of him at an SCBWI conference. But okay. Cecilia, Lamont? If you, don't, um, if you don't know SCBWI, it's the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. Cecilia will talk more about Tommy's involvement too. Um, just to explain what SCBWI means. Yep, and, and right. I I also want to evoke the movie Rashomon. Um, Tommy, who's the film buff, always evokes Rashomon when he has a version of an event that differs from yours. <laughs> so, um, and so what I want to say today is that Tommy is, was a complex and multifaceted man. 
And uh, Bob Hechtel sends out an email every morning that says, remembering Tommy. And those of us who think of ourselves as Tommy's special friend, um, every morning we're rather dismayed to find that he had many, many special friends. Uh, so what I wanted to say today is that today's really a glimpse from the art director's angle, but even then that, that angle from Laurent and I are gonna vary tremendously because of who we are and how we interact with him. So Rashomon we are. That's yes. good. And I'll just, um, I add to that, that um, as Cecilia was saying, that Tommy could connect with people, anybody. He could and would connect with anybody. He, it didn't matter if you were um, the first lady of the United States or you were the janitor cleaning up after a book signing. You were, he treated you the same. And so that's something you'll be hearing about. But with as you got to know him, you got to see the layers. And we're going to un veil some of the layers today for you of who Tommy was. Peel back the curtain. You know, Tommy is very theatrical. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> and that's one reason I wanted to start with a clip so you can hear Tommy himself. If you didn't have an opportunity to hear him talk at one of the conferences, this kind of sums up, I think, a lot about Tommy's presence. So I'm going to attempt to share the screen. If anybody's computer blows, um, sorry. This should work. It has. Okay. Can you actually see it? And I'll, yes. there's a way to get rid of this. And, okay. okay, let it roll. When I grow up, this is absolutely true, I am going to be, not I want to be, but I am going to be an artist, and I'm going to write stories and draw pictures for books, and I'm going to sing and tap dance on the stage. And I should probably say that I've earned money at all the lower above. Yeah. So. Now, not all artists know what they're going to be when they're ch children, but many, many do. George O'Keefe knew. My dear friend Trina Sharkheim knew at seven. Picasso knew. And some time come to it later, like Matisse. And it doesn't matter. What does matter is when you decide that that's your life path, be brave. And stick with it. Mm -hmm. That's as much as I wanted to share, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, he lived it. He lived it. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of go back in time a little bit and just get your first impressions when you guys first met with him or first worked with him. What was that like? Was he, I mean, he was already a legend, I think, at the time that you probably started working with him. But what was that experience like for you? Well, I'll start because I went um, I go all the way back to 1994 when I started at Putnam. And, uh, and when I arrived that day in February, there was already a note on an, on an empty desk. And it was a fax, for those of you too young to know what a fax is. It's one of those magical things that comes through a machine pre, um, prehistoric days. Um, and it was a welcome from Tommy. But I want to share uh, um, our first meeting. And with Tommy, our first meeting is always over lunch. So our first lunch was with Margaret Frith, who was his publisher and editor, and Arthur Levine, who was at that point um, an editor um, at, at uh, GP Putnam's. So we went to Coco Pazzo, and he was very impressed that I was able to get in. I made the reservation, and not only did I know the chef and the owner, he was impressed that I knew anything about food at all. And that incident was um, replayed every time he chose to introduce me to people I know or don't know. And his story goes that I ordered a huge plate of parpadelli with duck ragu. He has impeccable memory. And as the years pass, the size of the bowl of pasta and how small I was and how fast I inhaled that bowl of pasta sort of grew. And so that gives you a sense of Tommy, the, the, the storyteller. And I thought it was kind of a fitting first meeting with an author of Stregonona, which is about a pot of pasta. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he always chose to tell, tell people that, and that my casual comment was that I was making up for 5,000 years of famine. I think I may have said 3,000 <laughs> years, but again, top typical of Tommy, everything got bigger and I got a lot funnier. 
um, <laughs> as time passed, and I loved that. What about you, Laura? The first time I met Tommy was about 20 years ago, in 2000, I, about 2000. And it was at the an SCBWI conference. It was the, the big international conference in the summer in Los Angeles. And um, I was there, I'm wearing this shirt because, um, I don't know if you remember Jam's World shirts from the 90s. This is from, I don't know, mid 90s. I, it wasn't this shirt, but I was wearing a Jams World shirt. It was much more, I don't know, it had, had colors all natural and unnatural filling the shirt. And it was the, the party that, was, that happened at that conference, happens at that conference. And I looked and there was Tommy wearing the exact same shirt that I was wearing, just a little size difference. But, um, and I had never met him before. And I was there as an attendee, actually, because I was shifting. I used to be with the Muppets, and I was shifting from Muppets more into children's books. And so I went over, and Tommy turned. He goes, what have we here? <laughs> and his wonderful Tommy voice. And he was, we just bonded over the same fashion sense. And then he was like, oh, and it, Cecilia mentioned Arthur Levine. So Tommy scooped my elbow. He said, come with me. And he s took me over to, to Arthur. And, and, and said, Arthur, and Arthur turned around and said, what have we here? <laughs> and so he was like, um, mini me, or, you know. So we were kind of twins at that party and we, we met that way. So it wasn't a professional way we met first. It was um, destined to, to meet that way. So we knew each other over the years through SCBWI and also the Society of Illustrators in New York. Um, and then started working together about eight, eight or nine years ago, I think. So that was our first. Do you, do you remember the first book? I do. Well, actually, we have we we brought images with us. But Cecilia, why don't you start, Cecilia? We'll talk about our first books. Um, well, um, if you know Tommy, you will know that he loves having a team behind him. So I would be remiss if I don't introduce his Putnam team. Um, that's me with Tommy and Nancy Paulson, who is head of Nancy Paulson Books, uh, who was a publisher and editor for Tommy for a number of years, and Marika Tamara, our art director, who designed many, many of Tommy's books. And I want to mention that huge jumbo-sized glass of martini is not mine, <laughs> uh, and I'll leave it at that. So um, the next image shows Adelita, which is the reason why I'm wearing this scarf. Um, this this scarf is made from the end papers of Tommy DePaula. And I want to show you his signature. That was his present to me back in wow. the summer. Mm. Um, and we love the end papers and we all hoarded proofs of the end paper and we used them to wrap presents. And we told him that. <laughs> you know, so I that's the scarf there um, that Adelita, which is a, a Mexican uh, Cinderella story. Um, but I think my first book with him was Stregonota, her story. You know how as art directors, we work with so many books that are so far in advance. So when I first came in 1994, I was wrapping up a bunch of books, but Stregonona was really our first book together. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really a fun way for me to kind of understand uh, Tommy's legacy, his Stregonota stories. Um, but in promoting that book, one of my most vivid memories of Tommy and for me to understand um, what a special person he is, is how he interacted with his public. So I'm gonna tell you something that I'm gonna botch and Tommy's gonna be very disappointed in me. So he was promoting Stregonona on the Upper West Side of New York and we were in a school auditorium on the um, uh, Upper West Side and the auditorium was jammed full of people probably violating fire codes uh, with people sitting on the stairs and in the aisles and uh, kids, teachers, um, their principal. And I was surrounded, I was kind of new at Putnam at that point. So I was surrounded by people who were my fairly new colleagues and my um, bosses, my boss and my boss's boss, which at that point was Doug Whiteman. Um, and so he was going, he was big on stage and he would read the story and he'll say, well, you know how um, Stregonona breaks a spell, right? So, um, you know, when you have an overboiling pot of water, pasta, how do you stop it? 
So I'm going to botch this, but I'm going to try because it was so amazing. So he had everybody stretch out their arm right in front of you, mm-hmm. and he'll make you bend at the elbow. So you have this huge auditorium with people stretch out their arm and like bend at the elbow. And then he'll say, now pinch something with, with your thumb and middle finger and do this. Okay. Now pucker up your lips like you're sucking up something. <laughs> and then, of course, I look around at everybody, including my head of marketing, my boss, with going like, mm. <laughs> and he'll make everybody kind of go, mm. and he'll say, can't hear you. You can't break any spells that way. So he'll make people do it again, and you have to do it three times. And that's how you break the spell of an overboiling pot of pasta. And, um, and I'm thinking in this pandemic, I wonder if we should all do three <laughs> Calabrian kisses to break the spell. If only. If only. But yeah. anyway, so that's my Stregonona story. <laughs> you know, Tommy once told me that when he talked to little kids, he would tell them that Stregonona built his swimming pool. And he said all the kids would just see this little lady out in the backyard digging away, digging away, you know. Yeah, they didn't understand royalties, I suppose, in advance. Oh, well. Well, I'll, so I'll tell you about the first uh, book I worked on with Tommy, also Streganona. We have current th- themes coming through. Um, but Tommy and I were very serious together, very, very serious together. Um, here, I'll just show you how serious we were when we worked together. We had no fun at all. Um, he was pretty good with deadlines, but he needed a little help. So. As you can see, we actually, of course, had a lot of fun. Um, so for Team Tommy at Simon & Schuster, so Tommy, um, the original Streganona was published by Simon & Schuster, um, and he published both with Putnam and Simon & Schuster, as well as other publishers too, but main publishers were that thus, thus Cecilia and me. Um, and that's Emma Ledbetter, who was his editor um, for a, a long time at Simon & Schuster. And then um, this is more recently, as you can tell by my hair, and I just love that that image of Tommy because that set, says so much about him, who he was and is. Um, and uh, this is Kristen Ostby, who is his current editor, has been for a while. Um, and now here we're very serious. So um, my first book was Dragonona. We did for the 40th anniversary a uh, a reissue but I was able to get the original Streganona art that he did now, what is it, 45, six, seven years ago. And um, it, he, don't, he gave a lot of his art to the Curlin collection. And so I was able to get it from the Curlin collection. That's the full jacket. And he, with the typeset type for the flaps, because there were white backgrounds on the back, you can see the colors have faded over time. So our friend Photoshop could help a bit with it, but, um, but Hava Woolen, who is the production uh, manager at Simon & Schuster, and Dorothy Griven, who also is part of the team, who's our managing editor, and Alan Parado, who did, he scanned and color corrected the art, just did a magnificent job. So this was the first experience I had with Tommy was with the Streganona book itself. And then this is when we brought Tommy, that's the back of his head, to Simon & Schuster um, to meet everyone and, and present the new edition of the book. And as you can see, he's holding wrapped court as he did um, frequently with everything he, he, every group he was with. And as anyone who knows Tommy knows, a conversation with Tommy was basically hearing Tommy. Um, share stories. And you can get a word in once in a while, but uh, otherwise, but it, it was a wonderful experience. Fortunately, his stories were always full of good lessons, you know what I mean? Oh. Lots of takeaway, you know, about about being true to your art. I remember him telling my class to stop worrying about style, you know what I mean? Everybody always talks about what is your style when you're in school, you haven't learned his style. And he was like, it comes, you know, you, you do what it is that you do but um, he was so serious about work. But you have some samples, because I um, had never had the opportunity to visit Tommy at home like you guys have. And I think you have got to show, you got to share some of that. Well, we'll talk first, speaking of theater, um, <laughs> he was very theatrical. Before we get to that part, we, something, some, something else that Cecilia and I wanted to talk about was his theatrical side. Well, this book, Stage Struck, for me really epitomizes 
Tommy his appeal and his appeal to the child in us. In kids books, we all talk about the inner five-year-old. Tommy is all outer five-year-old, totally <laughs> uninhibited. He described himself really as a willful and outspoken child, and I'm so sure he's right about it. But he even as a grown man, his joy, his curiosity, his sense of mischief, his dismay, his indignation of the five-year-old are all completely vivid in him. So you see that in that image, the way he portrays himself. But I also feel that his love of cinema and television and plays is just legendary for all of us who know him but especially his passion for musicals and dance from both sides of the page. So he had a long history of performing. He tap danced when he was a kid. In college, he was um, in all, in high school and college, he was in all of the uh, theater clubs. He acted, he directed, he um, designed um, the sets, he designed costume. I think he even choreographed um, so I missed that stage of his life, but we shared a lot of um, plays, musicals, and for us, the ballet, we loved ballet, and we both did. Um, but it's, it's interesting, because when you look at this image from stage, stage Truck, it's so obvious what his appeal is. His love of his audience invites you to love him back. I've always said that if I were performing, I would want Tommy in the audience. So there was one particular play, which I've completely forgotten, um, where after a particularly enthusiastic response, his unbridled joy, his spontaneous gasp, his chortles, his belly laughs, at intermission, this lady behind us leaned over and with a huge smile said, it's too bad you really didn't enjoy that at all. And of course that elicited the biggest belly laugh from Tom. <laughs> and so for me, um, it's been, it's been what a wonderful journey to, to see him enjoying. He just loved everything with such a big heart. He has such a capacity to love people and things. Yeah, yeah it wasn't a performance. He was very genuine, very genuine. He, and he, he didn't really have filters for the joy. He didn't have filters for some of the other things too that um, we, we have- Oh, I know. I was, gonna, I was sharing it with, um, with Laurent that there was one, one musical that he despised, despised. And, <laughs> and I had forgotten what it was, but even when I visited him back in December, he brought it up so I didn't forget how much he hated that musical. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell us? You're not gonna tell us what it was? No, I don't think that's- fair to wow. people who were in the performance, but I think it was something I read about and I thought, oh, you might like it. Oh no, he didn't. <laughs> but he, but he was uh, always, um, you know, he was an entertainer and it, and it definitely came through in the art. And that's how he, he did act, he did do theater. And, and we shared the craft of theater background because my background is theater and TV and film. And I did costume design and I was with the Muppets um, as a Muppet designer and builder and then um, creative director for many years. Um, and so with that, I, that's how I approach story is with theater that, had, you know, that whole picture of it. And he did too. And um, so uh, I know we're with time. We have so many images, so many things we want to share. And so Pat, you had asked about his um, studio, his home and studio. So if you haven't seen pictures of his studio, all over, well over two hundred of you out there, welcome all of you. Um, prepare to be um, amazed because um, Tommy didn't do anything halfway. <laughs> um, so this is his studio. Now he uh, lived in New Hampshire and um, he had his house. He also had a barn that he converted into studio office space. But then this, his actual studio, he built onto the barn. So this is, um, as you can see there his, in the middle here, I can, if you can see my cursor, that's his drawing table right there. And he never bought one of, or two of something. He bought 20 or 30. There's the TV, see all the DVDs across the way. He can watch movies. But he had real, a beautiful setup that worked for him in the wonderful ways. And he had everything at his disposal right there. 
Um, so including it, a lot of photos of and artwork of nuns. Nun, many he had a lot. He has a, had a lot of nun friends. Um, yeah. Very sweet friends of his for many years, as well as he had many. That's one of the layers of Tommy. Um, and then he. So what you're seeing is the back behind him, behind his back is what I just showed you. And then past this lit drawing table, which is another corner he had, is the workspace and his library in his studio. And that's his library of inspiration, books that are inspirational, not his books, but other books, art books, glorious, beautiful art books. All the flat files are filled with amazing Italian papers. Some he would never touch. He just he would not buy one sheet, he would buy 100 sheets and there, there, there they would sit. Um, and that table to the right there is where um, Cecilia and I and, and all the people we've mentioned would sit with him in those horribly uncomfortable chairs. Sorry, Tommy, um, I never told you that. But, um, <laughs> but to work on projects. And speaking of his art and his... Uh, well, let's go back to the library for one sure. bit because I wanted to mention that he has this love of artists all artists and you see and design and architecture and you know knew where every single book was mm -hmm. and one of the latest books that he shared with us in the past year was he was heavily into michelangelo and there was a huge book and he would take it off these shelves and go through and pause it every single page mm -hmm. and make us look at the close-up of the hands that michelangelo did and he would gasp you can hear him gasp. Um, and then, but he also had a book about um, David Hockney and he's a huge David Hockney fan because he admired how he morphed from one stage to another. So this is really Tommy as not just an artist, but a lover of artists. So he was inspired by everybody from Giotto to Michelangelo to Matisse, which was, he, he aimed, he was saying this goal is to be Matisse. Um, but he loved um, living artists and illustrators as well. Um, so I'm just going to go too. into his stumbling a little bit, because for me, I feel that one of the things about Tommy as an artist that Laurent and I mentioned a bit, and it's interesting because we weren't the only one to notice, because in the foreword of the book, um, Tommy DePaolo, his art, his stories, which you're going to hear about later that Laurent is updating. Um, Trina Schott Hyman has a foreword in the book that mentions this specific topic. Tommy has been part of our children's book landscape for so many years. But the interesting thing is there are no Tommy wannabes out there. There are no Tommy imitators. And I think when you analyze this art, and Tom, uh, Trina says it best, so you have to look it up, so I'm not going to paraphrase her here. But I think his artwork is deceptively simple. It's so simple and so child friendly, and yet there's so many layers of them. But when you analyze this work, you also see the reason I wanted to mention, you know, things and people and artwork he loves, it always informs everything he does. I think part of Tommy was a 14th century monk mm -hmm. or, you know, a pre Renaissance artist. So the next thing I'm going to skip through rather quickly is this whole business about stumbling. He was horrified by my poor education that I did not know what stumbling was. So he, um, well, he made me watch him do that when I was visiting him, but he sent me this series of images where he shows what scumbling is. So for those of you who were like me, who don't know, scumbling is a painting technique in which colors are applied for him particularly as a dry brush over an underpainted area so that the previous color um, shows through. So it's a little like glaze, but not. And it's really to the, the secret to the luminosity in his paintings. So everything is really layered. So there's never just one application of anything. So even his line, as you can see, has multiple layers. So um, the lines are often double and triple applications. So they shimmer and no color is ever one color. It's many layers of color. So as you go through this, you kind of understand why his artwork glows the way frescoes do, the way stained glass windows do. Um, so he, he, he really, it's really hard to imitate what he does because he is so much one of a kind, even when he does extremely simple things that it's, not, it's so not so easy to do Tommy-like art. 
And so, so, so that's, what, that's what, from the, Jack, um, Jack. And, but he, he applied that style to a lot of different things. And that's Tommy with his painting. And um, this, I, and um, on scumbling, I, and I love that because it, like, like you were saying, Cecilia, no one can imitate what he did. And he took all of these inspirations of these artists that, that he loved and he put it in, but it was never didactic, it was never, um, not, I'm sorry, never derivative mm -hmm. or didactic, never derivative and never um, in anyone else's style. It was purely his. And when I, when this would have been, last October, I think, um, I went up with Kristen Ostby, the editor, um, to Tommy's and uh, a book that he was working on that he was not able to complete. Um, and we I said to try to get him to be motivated a bit. I'll say, why don't you show us how you paint? And he's like, I know what you're up to. And he said, all right. So we went in um, to his studio and he showed us how to paint. And so when Cecilia was talking about the scumbling as we were planning this, I remembered he, sh I took video of him doing this. So, um, so this is him talking about scumbling. This is called scumbling. Mm -hmm. It's a the theatrical scene painter's technique. Mm -hmm. And because scene paint was um, uh, pigment and chalk, and so it didn't have any flexibility. So in order to, to um, uh, what's the word I want? Do um, cover vast size. Well, no, um, blend. Mm -hmm. You just scumble. Okay. So precise at the same time. So it's just, you can see he, it's all, he doesn't think about it. It's just his hand. And um, that was for a, a well, I won't talk about the book more, but, but it was wonderful to see that this was last October. He was 85. And that and book is gorgeous. So I, I, I hope that you guys can get to see some of the paintings some of the time because the book itself is not finished, but the paintings are just mm -hmm. breathtaking, so. Will you talk a bit about the books that uh, you last worked with him on? The ones that are, you know, um, well, latest? We do that because I, well, I just have the slides in an order. Yep. That's the reason. <laughs> so we're not perfectly yeah. flexible. We can be, but it's always, you know, the show, the show biz. Um, we, what, we, what we wanted to talk about a little bit in between of, of that is some of his non-book art because we were talking about his inspirations. Um, sorry, Pat. <laughs> um, hey, we're live. We're live, and it's not even Saturday night. Um, and so he did a lot of art that many of you have never ever seen, and he called it non-book art instead of fine art because, rightly so, children's book illustration is fine art. And it was his non-book art, and so um, Cecilia and I can talk about um, some of this as we go through. But these are all. Um, images of, you can see the scale and size. And that bench was not, um, was not art directed. He has, has those pillows there like that. Um, he, a Madonna and child theme he would do, but you can see some of the... I'm gonna jump in and correct you, Tommy. The, uh, uh, the wrong. Tommy's life is all art directed. Oh, that's all true, curated. that's true. I so should say, it might not be art directed by us, but right. every scene is... It was not set dressed for this photo. It was part of his daily life art direction. So true, <laughs> so true. Um, so this, you can see he worked very, very big in acrylic. Um, and it's just so beautiful. And it, you see that inspiration, like some of the, the artists you were talking about, Cecilia, mm -hmm. brought into that. Frida Kahlo was one of his major, major influences. He loves Frida. Oh, this is a Frida, he calls it Frida's table. Isn't it, so you're looking down at a, at a Mexican meal. Um, looks very tasty, actually, I must say. Um, it is lunchtime in my time zone. So. Um, by the way, Cecilia and I are in New York, in case you're wondering where we are coming from. And, and Pat Up is- West Side, both of us. Pat, Pat is a Brooklyn lady. So this goes back further, and this is called Brothers. And this is, um, 
such a beautiful piece because it's so different. If you were to see it, you would know it was Tommy. Oh, and like Cecilia, you're talking about his, the hands. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. yes, the thing about hands. Very, very much him. So you see Tommy in it, but you see the other inspiration, the frame, everything about it is uh, thought through. And he and loves who all. So that's, you see the, um, the heavy black line influence in this particular stage. Mm -hmm. He had gallery shows too, right? Oh yeah. Have, yeah. Was every there, year. yeah, every year. And he had, I think it was Santa Fe, is that right? Am I thinking right? He, Bob, he Bob had a show in Santa Fe, but also in Cape Cod. Um, yeah. So he had a lot of shows. Yeah. Um, and then he did, this is a smaller piece, not that much smaller, but, um, and the piece on the, on the end is not his. That's another, another illustrator, a gift someone gave to him. But, but the, the tree by the river is his piece. And they're just so beautiful and so exquisite. This, this goes back to, does that say 96, 86, the signature? Um, can't read it. Um, 86. 86. So now, I, if I had not known this is Tommy's, I would not have known. This, so he, he would do all kinds of different experimentation just for himself. Some of these were in galleries, some were never seen by mm. others. And some he would not want to be seen. Uh, when we were at his studio and I was taking photos of a lot of these pieces for the book, I'll talk more about that, Cecilia mentioned about his, his life. Um, there's some he was like, no, do not take a picture of that, <laughs> which I thought they were exquisite, yeah. but to him, something was off. And look at this, isn't this just so much fun? <laughs> he loved the, the pears, he had pears as a recurring- And watermelon. Pear. And watermelon. Mm -hmm. So, so beautiful. And then this is, these are three pieces, speaking of watermelon, um, that are in his house. And so his house was a work of art. And um, we're, so we're gonna sh show you some of images of his house, but also look at this, There's, these are pears and that painting is not faded. That is how he painted it. Just that subtle uh, kind of whistler evoked uh, play with tones and, and shades and, and tints of color. But that is a room in his house and he decorated the beams mm -hmm. as well in his beautiful way. He, he surrounded himself with art. And he understands the theatricality of, of the house. So that pair painting is on the right. So it's in a very dark room with dark wood paneling and it pulls you all the way in because it's almost, the pairs are almost barely there. So you have to go all the way in. It draws you all the way in mm -hmm. for you to be able to really appreciate it. Um, but this series is from last December. I visited him after Christmas and Christmas was a big thing for Tommy. Uh, for Tommy, birthdays, Christmas, and a number of things. He's, he's a man of rituals. Um, and he loves candles. He lights every single one. Um, this is the, um, I think he calls this a chapel. He is really a living room that he no longer uses, but he puts a lot of the um, Madonna um, artwork, style artwork there. But the, um, the, the candles in the front, he, at the end of the evening, he, uh, at the start of the evening, he'll go in and light every single one. So you can move on to um, Laurent. Um, so that's a chapel. And this is what he calls the Mercer room. It's a huge, it's a great room. It's like a cathedral. Um, and he had pared down. He, this past uh, December, 2019, he was down to two Christmas trees from six of them. So this is one of the two Christmas trees, but everything, so you see the candles in the foreground, those are gonna be lit. Um, and he loves lighting candles and the, those candles on top they're all battery operated now. So Bob kind of says, thank God I can just click that <laughs> without having to climb up and light every single one and then blow them out at the end of the evening. Then his second um, Christmas tree is with red roses. So you know his book, um, Christmas Remembered, um, that actually is a book for adults that talks about all of his memories of Christmases, but he has a ritual of folding these these red paper roses. And he told me that they hired an intern from Colby Sawyer College uh, in New London to, to augment the red roses that inevitably gets destroyed every year. So that's the, um, that's the second Christmas tree. And I'll just, with the, the, the battery operated candles, the Luminara candles, and 
and he had, and I think we keep talking about Bob Hitchell, who's uh, Tommy's uh, head of his right studio hand. and every, every and and um, and uh, a phenomenal person who wrote "Hi Bob." Um, Hi Bob. But um, we love you, Bob. <laughs> we love you. Bob showed me once where there were, I think, like twenty or thirty more boxed candles <laughs> down there. That, but inspired me and my husband, Chris, to buy many Luminara candles. So Tommy inspired us that way too. So this is him lighting um, the candle of his, uh, his designed menorah. And of course he had to curate everything. So you notice the blue of the candles matched the blue of the scarf. And of course he had phenomenal memory. So this is a scarf that I bought him years, well, not that many years ago, but at the, at the last change of election, he said that he wanted to be Canadian. So when I was in Vancouver, I bought him a scarf with a maple leaf and said, now you can walk around saying, you know, talking <laughs> Canadian. But anyway, he remembers all of that. So this was back in December and every night he would recite the prayers and light the candle. And that was one of several menorahs um, around his house. It's kind of like with art, I just, um mentioned like rel religions to him was kind of like or he took what he what he loved about religion mainly catholicism of course but and made it uh he took the joy and took the rituals and really uh, made it his own and he didn't judge yeah. with that and it was very um inspiring that way too so um but then of course there's another cathedral of tommy's yeah this <laughs> is um Tommy's Kitchen, which is amazing. Again, why buy one pot when you can buy 17? <laughs> he is the, a man of, I believe, seven ovens. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, um, every time I visited, he would make me dinner. And my job that particular night was to zest and juice the lemon. So you see how it was all curated and designed like a still life on the foreground on the left. And I was supposed to sit in that chair. He was very specific, sit in this chair. And I was supposed to zest the Bayer lemon and juice the lemons. He had two kinds and the juicer was laid out right there. It was all curated. So <laughs> that's him making dinner and that's Bob. That's, that's a phenomenal Bob who's, the, who's Tommy's right hand man who is extremely hard to catch so this is one of the very, very few images of Bob. He does. Bob, you may not be happy about this. Yeah, he, he knew, he, he looked up when I took this picture. So, <laughs> okay. um, so that, he always makes his dinner. And this wow. is the ritual for dinner. So he always sat in the right seat on the far side. And I always happened to sit on the seat closest to the left. And he would light all of the candles and have everything all set before dinner. So that is so much part of working with Tommy. And um, so before you even talk business, you have this elaborate dinner and it would be hours and hours of funny stories sitting at that table until I start to droop and he gets more animated by the hour. <laughs> I, 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 I remember feeling really droopy at the end of the night and sliding under the table, but he would just, he would just, he loved the company. He loved the story. And it was so, I mean, everything was art directed and so beautiful and, and, um, and Tommy would not be having any cocktails the past many years, but, um, but the rest of us were, which is one reason perhaps we, we were getting tired. Um, I'm just going to uh, move into you because Pat, you had asked about the last, some of the last projects we worked on. Right, we only have a few more minutes. I wanted to ask another question too, because he had certain themes that he kept coming back to, well, not kept coming back to, but that he incorporated into his work and you can see everything he loved he put in his books the religion even christmas you know what i mean um the food the pasta it's in there do you think uh, before you tell me about the last book do you think there was anything in his life that he was passionate about that he didn't manage to get into a book i mean even his dog even bronte was in the books right maybe ethel merman because <laughs> he loved and judy garland and judy garland Mm -hmm. And we, on more than one occasion, listened to the Ethel Merman disco album. I'm not kidding. I believe. Right time. <laughs> There's no business like show business with tambourines. Um, so I don't know if he actually did put them in, because any, but, so other than that, but for the themes you mentioned, because certainly birds, 
stars and moons and flowers and rabbits and uh, mm -hmm. dogs and cats. And I can't think of anything that was like that, that he didn't. There will be, there will be a compendium on Tommy. Do you know what I mean? About analyzing all the stuff that went into his work. Because I know when you did the SCBWI program, when he was the focus of one of our intensives and he talked about how he saw the books almost theatrically. You mm -hmm. cast the characters, you mm -hmm. come up with the costumes, you direct the action. And one of those pictures that you first showed of one of his uh, pictures where the woman standing in the doorway, it really directs the eye. Everything was so staged in the books and so cleverly done and beautifully done. You know, but I, I do want you to tell us about the last book that you worked on with him. Um, and then we're gonna take some questions because we only have a few minutes left. So the last books. Well, I'll, I'll uh, start with, um, just getting this pulled up. Um, come from ah. what inspired the last, the, this is the last book that um, I worked with him on that he wrote and illustrated. His, his, his last book that he wrote and illustrated, actually. Um, and this is in his, in that space, in his li library workspace in the studio. And it's his meditation corner. And he meditated every day and he surrounded himself with music and um, incense or whatever he needed and he meditated every day and um, and even when I spoke with him last time I spoke with him <clears throat> excuse me which was uh, just a, a week or so before he passed away which is still extremely hard to say um, we talked about the current world and uh, and his meditation really you know he that was something he was a daily practice already um, and then he continued that. And it really did, I think, help him clear his mind. So he wanted to do a book ab about meditation for a picture book, but, you can, but to not make it preachy and not make it um, inaccessible. And so he did this book called Quiet. And um, for those of you who are listening and watching who are children's book creators, if you're illustrators or writers, and, and if anyone ever tells you quiet books don't sell, ignore them because this book, the title is Quiet, by the way. Um, it was number one, not number one, but it was New York Times bestseller when it came out and it did very well. And, um, but I think the world needed it then and still needs it. But it was a, his way of, um, of creating a book about uh, being the connectivity of nature and us and the heartbeat of, speeding up and slowing down. So I just wanted to share a few. This is his writing out the manuscript by hand. Once it was typed up, some of his corrections. All of this is in a book that is actually what you were just uh, saying there should be. And there is a book that we'll, we'll talk about real quick at the end of a biography book of his. This is some of his character sketches, the development, wow. using recycling scraps of paper, working out it's a grandfather and two uh, children in the story. And then playing with color and you can see the scumbling layers there, but this had white backgrounds. So he didn't use that. That's paper. Bronte. I'm just going to. That's Bronte, out. his dog. Yes. Who passed away. Also, but still appears in his books. Um, and so that is, that's quiet. Um, and then I know we wanted real quick, we're going to finish things up. We're going to talk about uh, SCBWI a bit too. Well, I wanted to say that because when, when Tommy first became rather ill, we talked a lot about his legacy. And I feel that so many people, so many people out there in the public know Tommy as an author and an illustrator of children's books, but they may or may not know how impactful he was as a teacher and a mentor. He was definitely my teacher and my mentor. My and, um, and this is an image of him with the SEBWI board uh, back, I think, in 2010. Well, the Illustrators but, Committee on the board. Illustrators the board. Committee, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. So he was really crucial in putting the I, the illustrator, in SEBWI. He wanted to include the illustrators. Um, he also convinced me to join the board way back in 2003 because he impressed on me the need, the imperative to give back. And I lived that every single day because Tommy says it's important. So back in 2003 with Robert Sabuda and Priscilla Burris, we hatched a plan for um, Professional Illustrators Day, which eventually became what you would know of as Illustrators Intensive. Mm -hmm. He also taught the first master class, um, master class intensive, and his hand-selected students, this is a very small group, 
included illustrators that eventually went on to win the Caldecott Honor Awards, Eugene Yelchin and David Ezra Stein. He also sponsored the Tommy DePaolo Award, which is now called the Narrative Art Award. So he has a huge legacy. Mm -hmm. And I felt, so in talking about that, um, I really wanted to highlight his legacy as a mentor. Mm -hmm. So our last book together, um, <laughs> this is me after a very long night, and Tommy's chipper as hell. I'm in those uncomfortable <laughs> chairs. I'm exhausted. He's writing the 18th version draft of the manuscript. So this is the book that his working uh, title was called The Apprentice, and it's basically set um, kind of a pre-Renaissance days of a little apprentice boy who was uh, recruited to, to, be, uh, to, to learn from a master artist. And he wanted to convey the whole sense of the time it takes and the drudgery it takes to be an artist. Um, so he called it The Apprentice, but when, when the election changed things for him, uh, the, the, the recent title was called Becoming an Artist. And you see where the influence came from. Um, but he was close to finishing the manuscript when he passed. So we will probably finish this and find, um, we are zeroing in on an illustrator that he found, one of his mentees, um, to illustrate this book for him. But it's a very important book for, for me because he was my mentor and um, he taught me everything I knew. I jokingly called him my tuition-free uh, practice <laughs> education. He's offered that to a lot of people, do you know? He's helped so many people. And real quick before we have just a, I just want to mention, so this is a book that uh, started with Cecilia um, that had a different title. It's it, Barbara Elliman, who is a good, who is a good friend of Tommy's um, and was the book links editor for many, many years. Uh, she uh, wrote this book and it, it came out uh, from Putnam in the nineties, I believe, or, or late nineties. Um, and since then now, um, we, Simon and Schuster, we're, we're publishing it, but have revised it, and she has, Barbara has um, added to it, updating it in the past many years, past 20 years, and uh, That's the one with the Trina Sharp Hyman um, forward that you yes. must see. Wonderful. And so this is, and so for the cover, this is a photo shoot we did on that bench you saw, and one of his many scarves, and I added many, a lot of his characters around him, because he always loved that uh, Walt Disney photo of all his characters from Time Magazine, so that's a perfect it, it, picture. Walt, eat your heart out. So, um, so that's this is this com this is coming out this fall. And another great resource is something Bob has spent many, many, many years uh, crafting is Tommy's website. It's Tommy.com. Has all of his books on there. Um, it's a great resource. And I know we need to. Get well, to you mean you want to save some time for questions? But show the the quote that's on his desk because I think that's a lovely way to close this part down. This is what was on his his drawing table is um, that he drew and taped. In the end, only three things matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things not meant for you. That's gorgeous. I think that's Tommy. That's Tommy's hand as well, showing mm -hmm. us. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's lovely. He's meant so much to so many people, you know? But I do want to give everybody a chance to ask questions, because um, you guys know things that others will not in textbooks. So um, can we turn it over to Allison to field the questions? Yes, first let me say that was just, that was, that was lovely. That was so wonderful and warm and that was just perfect. Hmm. Um, we do have a few questions. I did ask um, friends to tailor those questions to our topic today. Um, one of the questions, came in and it said, I know I have read that his dad took many home movies. I also read that he would flip his sandbox over to tap dance. <laughs> Do you know if there are any home movies left? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot. I think his, his, his love with the camera, uh, the love of the camera started really young and he, he showed a lot of those. Um, and you could see the glimmer in his eyes as a five-year-old. You can see how much he loved performing. And yes, that Sandbox story um, he told many times. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then all, all the photo, photos and, and the, well, they weren't videos then, the films. Um, he would always point out and say, who's the showbiz boy in that photo? Because that's why him and his siblings and Tommy's like, 
I guess he, from very young, he was how he was taught me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the questions, it's so interesting, um, and, and um, I wouldn't even think about it <laughs> really, but um, it talks about criticism. Um, how did Tommy handle criticism or reaction to perhaps art or his work that was outside of what he believed or he saw within it? I, I guess in working with him, especially as an art director, mm -hmm. um, were there, what was it like to channel some of those energies or wasn't that needed? You, you mean um, us giving art direction or like a bad review? I think both. I think that the criticism is specifically talking about um, his books, but also you kind of helping to direct his books. What was that like? Well, <laughs> criticism of his books. I won't repeat the words here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not always, not always, but... Um, but he, 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 he told me, because I wrote a novel, a uh, YA novel that I illustrated called Draw the Line. And um, when it first came out, uh, he said, you have two choices. You can either read every review or read no reviews. I said, well, which do you? He said, I said, which do you do? He said, eh, a little of both. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he's a pro um, at, with, um, but it was art with art, working with him as an art director. I, I wonder, yeah, Cecilia, what, what do we have the same thoughts? I don't know. What do you, what do you well, think? I think he was very well established by the time I worked with him, started working with him in 1994. And so, you know, as you all know, as art directors, we don't go in and criticize anything, even if they're beginning artists, you just don't. Um, there's things that work better and things that don't work as well. So we talk about herding cats, you know, we're trying to kind of, you know, kind of encourage him in one direction versus another. So you saw that expression of me um, working with him at the very end. That's me of like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this for the 17th time. Um, and, but again, like all artists, all, all authors, um, he will take what he needs and discard the rest. And for me, he has a very strong sense of what is him and what's not him and what he likes and what he doesn't like. So I would never try to convince him to do something that's not him, but then I won't try to convince somebody, anybody, any illustrator to do something that's really not them either. Mm -hmm. That's right, Laura. Yes, I mean, exactly. yeah. Yeah, I, because we, yeah, we don't, we, we are there to guide and to but with Tommy, and so since he came to he came to work with me after working with Cecilia, so it was even later in his career when he was the legend. Um, and so, but he was very open, very open to hearing thought. <clears throat> and just like what you had said, what you said, Cecilia, he he took what was meaningful for him, and he approached. It has a very it's very simple looking some of his art, but. It's simple in the way that ballet looks so effortless, but you know the dancers have bloody stumps for feet okay. <laughs> wrapped up in those shoes. He worked so hard to get at, like if there's a manuscript he couldn't get at, he loved like, bouncing off ideas. But I, one thing I did um, that in the last few years note is even though he was going pretty full steam into his early 80s, he would voice this um, that he he had self some self not self doubts but lack of motivation um, you know things that are what we call human <laughs> um, that a lot of us get younger than in our early eighties and he was very much open to it, well he didn't want a cheerleader he didn't want someone to say you're wonderful I love you he, well he did but he um, but he <laughs> who wouldn't um, but he wanted someone who treated him with respect and and so we're working through the manuscript with the editor and the art with me and and it really was uh sculpting together in a, in a way so he was wonderful that way a real pro you know he had no ego about that you know he, um when i worked with him so. lovely and and the quote that you shared too at the end i mean um to embrace that you know letting go of things that are not meant for you Perhaps criticism sometimes is just not meant, <laughs> yeah. you know, for you or, or a part of that. This has been just so, um, so wonderful. Um, Pat, yeah. 
I just want to add something because in terms of that letting go thing, he also made a point that when he would go to conferences and people would be working on a project, they'd just show it to him and he would always be like, oh, this is wonderful. He'd give them some feedback. But he said he would go to the conference a year later and they'd show him the same thing. And that was his attitude towards the work too. He said, if it isn't working by now, let it go and work on something else. And I think that's something we all have kind of a hard time doing when you have like a story you want to work on. And sometimes it's just not ready. And Tommy made that point. You know, sometimes the penny will drop later, you get back to it and it will work, but don't keep going back to the same thing. There was just every time you talk to him, there'd be something. And I just wanted to say the last thing, we were at a conference, we had elves who were helping us with the intensive. And this woman walked in, one of our elves walked in. People, actually, the people do this too. I say elves are not really elves, they're, we call them elves, they're helpers. They're helpers. Because in our world, they may be really elves. Anyway, yes, sorry. Yes, but that elf is an honorific. It is, oh uh, it Yes, is. yes. So uh, one of the elves walked in to help and I was sitting at the table with Tommy and she was getting her instructions about what she was going to have to do at the intensive. And then she turned and saw Tommy and she screamed. And she screamed and she was like, oh, and you know she started performing and everything and then when she calmed down tommy said to me do you have a camera can you catch that can you have her do it again <laughs> and i was like and i love that you know what i mean he was ever theatrical and ever lovely and ever welcoming and um and i think you guys you cecilia and laurent you really knew him well you know he brought you into his home into he knew a lot of people well <laughs> knew a lot of people well i know like you said he was seeing others cecilia <laughs> Yeah. Allison, thank you and how I expect this opportunity just to talk about him yes, because I think it you. all it hit us all as quite a shock and quite a deep profound loss you know and he was so special to so many people like you said it, it's a it's a nice moment to be able to remember him mm -hmm. thank you George yes so much Laurent Cecilia thank you so much this was awesome uh, so beautiful. My wife and I had the pleasure of hanging out with Tommy back in the early 2000s when he did some speaking gigs with the uh, uh, teacher workshops we went to, and it was just a good time. So thanks for taking <laughs> Did he ever teach you the kiss. Calabrian kiss? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> mm. That's a good way yeah. to leave it. That's that a is good a good way to, way to end. <laughs> it's but perfect. You have to act like you mean it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank all you right. all. And thank everybody for who tuned in as well. Yes. Thanks thank so you. Much. Pat, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. See you then. Bye -bye. Thank you.